Dear students, we are ready for what is arguably the most important chapter of our class. <clears throat> that is after you have internalized the material in chapter one, of course. And why is that? Because mutual funds are most likely to be in your future. They have become the go-to investment for employer-sponsored plans, 401ks, 403bs, and for many people, Roth IRAs and other types of IRAs, such that we believe we want to emphasize mutual funds at the beginning of the semester. Other textbooks, other um, um, instructors, professors who teach Introduction to Investments often will put mutual funds after stocks and bonds. Why? Because it makes sense to understand the underlying investments in detail before you take a look at mutual funds, which then turn around and invest in stocks and bonds for you. And there's merit to this approach. However, <laughs> we know from history that we're going to lose many of you for whatever reasons. And so because mutual funds are so important and they're most likely to be in your future as an investment choice, we want you, all of you, as many as possible to learn as much as possible about these investments for the masses. Yes, dear students, mutual funds have become ubiquitous. You like that word, ubiquitous? It means everywhere. You can't help, if you're in this culture, to see advertising and discussions and arguments back and forth about the various types of mutual funds. So we're going to emphasize this chapter as a very important chapter for you and remembering that you're going to be the investment guru, <laughs> the financial wizard for your friends and family and co-workers, and you can't let them down, dear students. Oh, no, no, no. So let us start here on slide number two and ask the question, what is a mutual fund? Well, to review, it's an investment company that invests its shareholders' money in a diversified portfolio of securities. <clears throat> investment company is the legal term, but you're not going to hear that unless you work in the industry. You're going to hear mutual fund. That's the popular term. And what are the two major advantages that we hope you will burn into the back of your eyelids? Professional money management and diversification. And uh, nothing's perfect, and neither are these, but still, they are wonderful advantages of mutual funds. Each fund has a specific objective. We'll learn about all the different types of object objectives of mutual funds. And there are over 12,000 funds that you, wait a minute, 12,000 funds? Are there 12,000 different breakfast cereals in the grocery store? I, well, sometimes it seems that way, but no, 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 there aren't. There are 12,000 different types of cars on the road? No. How did we get 12,000 mutual funds? Hang on. We'll see that the industry exploded at, uh, over certain years. And we'll later learn why that happened. And as we've stated, many people will choose mutual funds for their retirement account investments. 401ks, 403bs, other employer-sponsored plans, and IRAs, traditional IRA, Roth IRA, and all their various cousins, the simple, the SEP, and the like. Very, very popular type of investment. Slide number three. This is the graphic that we saw back in chapter one. And as I said, I'm very proud of this graphic. I did it myself. With <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, and here we are, dear students. We're the little people. And I notice more and more of them are women because women are getting smart and realizing that men are the big dummies that they always thought we were. And now we've proved it. <clears throat> and we give our $50, $100 a month, more if we can afford it, to the people in the top hats. They're the mutual fund managers, the portfolio counselors. Uh, they go by various names, but they're money managers, basically. 
And luckily, more and more of them are women. Why is that? Because it's already been shown statistically that women are better investors than men. <coughs> I will leave the reason why to your own <laughs> devices. I have my reasons why, but uh, they, they so far have not been proved the reasons why. They've just been proved that they're better money managers on the whole. And what do they do with that money that we give them? They create a pool of money, and I know it kind of looks like a potato, but it's supposed to be a little pond or pool. pool. And there are millions of us little people giving our money to the uh, money managers, and so there are billions of dollars in these pools of money. And that's why it's called a mutual fund. Uh, but again, what's the legal term? And you should know this because you're going to be a, the, the uh, expert. An investment company, and doesn't that make a lot of sense? Wouldn't I, if I were king of the world, which I'm not, I would just ban the term mutual fund and have everybody use the term investment company. You want shoes, you go to a shoe company. You want cars, you go to a car company. You want insurance, you go to an insurance company. You want investments, you go to an investment company. Don't go to an insurance company for your investments later, later, later. Okay, okay. And so, what do these people do? They have billions of dollars to invest. So if they invest in stocks, it's called a stock mutual fund. And remember, stocks are ownership. If they invest in bonds, it's called a bond mutual fund. Bonds are loans, right? And if they invest in the short-term money um, uh, cash investments, short-term as we discussed in chapter one, they are called money market mutual funds. And usually the the mutual fund disappears. You just people hear people call it a money market. And they don't, you know, just buy five stocks or 10 bonds. They, they, they have billions of dollars, so they buy 100 or 200 or 500 stocks or bonds. And so what do you get? Professional money management. These people are paid very well to run these funds. And you get instant diversification. Because the fund owns 100 or 200 shares, I mean, 200 different types of companies, two shares in 200 companies or bonds from, from companies and municipalities and government entities. If one company or one entity goes belly up, it's not a big deal in, 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 in the mutual fund. If you only own five stocks and one of them disappears, that's a big <laughs> That's a big deal in your personal portfolio. What's the downside? Well, diversification means that on balance, your potential for increase is going to be lowered. But also your potential for decrease is going to be lowered. So we're willing to give up some of that upside for the protection on the downside. It's not a guarantee, folks. Mutual funds can lose tremendous sums of money, and some do. But in general, the diversification is going to give us some protection that is difficult for us as individuals to get on our own. Not that we can't do it, and we'll learn later on how we do it, but it's just difficult because we have our lives to live, and and we, we have our work and our kids and whatever. These people, they're paid. This is their job. That's what they do. So think about that. Okay. So let's continue here. Let's click this little button. Tech, me and technology don't get along too well, too, folks. I'm sorry. Okay, so here we have the growth of the mutual fund industry. Wow. In 1940, when the Investment Company Act of 1940 was written and uh, by the Congress, there were already 70 mutual funds. Interesting. The mutual funds predated the legislation that made them <laughs> uh, legal entities. We'll discuss that in a bit here. In 1970, there were 350. So some you know, substantial growth. Ten years later, 600. Look at what happened in the 1980s. By 1990, there were 2,000. And then in the hyperkinetic decade of the 1990s, when the market went in two directions, up and way up, we had 9,000 funds. And at the end of 2000, that should be 19, I got to change that. 2019, there were 12,089 funds. 
yeah, well, we we get the data around May or so for the previous year. So the year the data the data for 2020 hasn't come out yet, but um, we'll have the de we'll have that 2019 fixed for, by the time you've taken a look at this. Hmm, what happened in the 1980s and 90s that allowed the fund industry to just explode? Well, there were many things happening um, with the awareness of uh, of investing and the popularity of investing becoming more and more uh, prescient, more and more uh, um, um, omnipresent in the industry. Uh, cable news with its and financial 24-hour uh, channels and the like. And um, also we'll see how the industry exploded with different offerings later on when we get to the different types of mutual funds. Suffice to say, the growth has been exponential. Okay. In 1980, slide number five, 5 million Americans owned funds, holding 3% of their household financial assets. As of December 2019, almost 104 million Americans, that's about a third of the population, in almost 60 million households own mutual funds. That's about a little less than half of all U.S. households. And why is that? As we said, much of the reason has to do with the fact that these have become the choice for 401ks, 403bs, other employer-sponsored plans, as well as well as people's IRAs. At the end of 2019, the mutual fund assets totaled almost $26 trillion, holding 23% of the household's financial assets. They are now the largest financial intermediary, which is a fancy way of saying they hold on to other people's money, followed by commercial banks and life insurance companies. Life insurance companies? Yes, often called the invisible bankers. And if you are so inclined, there is the, the investment company Factbook that, as I said, is published about May of every year. And you go to ICI, Investment Company Institute, that's the trade group, it's a nonprofit, but it's funded by the for-profit mutual funds, ICI.org. And there is a wealth of information and data for you to peruse. If you are so inclined, it can be daunting, but it's fun for those of us who are very much um, in, in, enamored with the industry, as I am. <laughs> Slide number six. Let's take a look at the growth of mutual fund assets. In 2007, there were $13 trillion in the industry. And look at what happened in 2008. Wow. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, but we, you know, some people ran at that time, panicked, and, and it was the worst time to do it. But if you held on, the industry and, the, and your assets came back to the point where uh, in the end of 2019, there were $26 trillion. So, so doubled the growth in 12 years. Pretty amazing. And remember, much of this, about, I don't know, three or four, three or two, three, maybe three or four trillion, I haven't looked lately, is in money market mutual funds, which you know barely grow at all, 0.1%. Uh, so it's not the same exponential growth we see if we were just invested in stocks. And some of it, of course, a lot of it's in bonds also. So we would not see the same kind of growth we expect from just stocks <clears throat> if we if if we had invested everything in stocks. But still, that's a pretty, pretty substantial growth uh, between 2007 and 2019, basically doubling, doubling in value. Um, was uh, there's a little yeah in 2000 let's read here in 2018 there was a small drop especially at the end I don't know if you remember the end of the year Christmas Eve it was one of the worst days around uh, but we came back and 2019 was a great year for stocks and I'm really interested in seeing the 2020 data when it comes out in May because 2020 was one of the most unusual <laughs> years on record thanks to that darn 
dreaded virus. Uh, let's take a look at some of the advantages of mutual funds because every investment has advantages, every investment has disadvantages. As we said, the two major investments, I mean, I'm sorry, advantages of mutual funds are pooled diversification and professional management. As we said, the diversification is a process whereby investors buy into a diversified portfolio of securities for the collective benefit of the individual investors. Because most of us simply don't have twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 lying around the house to buy 20, 30, 40 or so stocks. Plus, that's a lot of work to, you know, to, 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 to keep track of all, to, first of all, to identify those, all those different individual stocks. We're going to learn in the investment, I mean, sorry, investigation techniques and valuation techniques. And it's work, folks. It's something that has to, it doesn't happen by itself unless you just decide you're going to throw darts at a dartboard. And, um, then we have to keep track of them. Then we have to stay on top of them and, and continue our research. You just can't buy a company and let it, and you know, some of them, you know, a few companies you can, but, but most companies, even, even all, you really should continue researching even after you've purchased a stock. And then, as we said, the professional money management is another great advantage. The managers are supposed to know what they're doing, and they're certainly getting paid enough. And some are very, very good, folks. Some of these are the best people, best you know, best investors in the world, and others, eh, not so much, as we'll see. Two other advantages is that you really don't need a whole lot of money. You can start with twenty-five or fifty bucks a month. That's kind of difficult. It's not impossible with individual stocks. It's a lot harder with individual bonds because bonds investors are normally expected to, as we'll see later on, to pony up twenty, thirty, hundred thousand dollars. So, so we can get started with 50 bucks a month from our paycheck, from our checking account. And what does that do? That means we buy 25 cents of Apple and, and 30 cents of IBM and 20 cents of GM. And you got the idea. The mutual fund company takes care of all that. And this last uh, advantage comes from the wealthy barber. And I wish I had thought of this, but I didn't. And so we'll give David Chilton his due. The PETA factor. PETA factor? Pain in the, mm, yeah, yeah, pretty cool, huh? It's right. It's, he's right. He's absolutely right. Once you've chosen the mutual fund, which that's a difficult task, as we'll see, considering all the options and, and, and competition out there. Once you've chosen the mutual fund, there's nothing more for you to do. You let the man managers take care of the uh, investments. Yeah, you need to review your mutual funds every six months, every year or so. But um, no, it's out of your hands. It's a, an indirect investment, as we learned back in Chapter 1. Okay, what are the drawbacks? What are the disadvantages? Remember, fuck, folks, nothing is free. You know, nothing is perfect. Everything that we humans have done uh, has disadvantages. And so there's some disadvantages to mutual funds. Well, we're getting charged. Transaction costs. Some mutual funds charge sales fees called loads, and we'll discuss all the different types of fees in detail in our next presentation. Front-end loads, back-end loads. Many others are no-load funds, which means they don't charge an upfront fee, but they can wind up costing you more than load funds over time. Huh? Why is that? Because of the annual operating expenses. Every mutual fund, except for a few, as we're going to learn in the next presentation, charge annual operating expenses because you know, people don't get people to work for free. And you said there's a couple that are free. Yes, there's a few that are free, and they're basically what we call loss leaders. If you have anything, if you're into our marketing and, and sales and the like, you know, there are some retailers who will mark down things to the point where they don't make any money off of them, but they're just to bring you in the door. Who's famous for this? Uh, Fry's Electronics. They would advertise that they'll, they'll sell you a uh, strip of um, uh, an electronic strip for outlets for $2, you know, you know, cost them like five or six, whatever. Why would they do that? Because when you're in the store, they're hoping you're going to buy a 99-inch television set. <laughs> 
And <clears throat> lastly, many mutual funds do not match the market's performance. What? Aren't the mutual fund managers supposed to know what they're doing? Well, we'll learn why this is, why many mutual funds don't match the market's performance. But we're being charged. And, and that's our theme for our second presentation, because as the investment gurus for your friends and family and coworkers, you really need to understand this. And most people know they're being charged. They understand that but they don't really understand how they're being charged. And we're going to learn how in this class. Slide number nine. Now there are three major mutual fund types, investment company types, there are many others, but we're going to focus on the three major ones. And for decades, the two major ones were open-end mutual funds and closed-end mutual funds. And as we'll see, a third type of mutual fund has entered into the fray and has become very popular. <clears throat> Open-end mutual funds, approximately 80% of mutual funds, are a type of investment company in which investors buy shares from and then sell them back to the mutual fund itself. There's no limit on the number of shares the company can issue. Shares are issued and then redeemed by the investment company at the request of investors. So you can purchase, you buy shares from the mutual fund company, and then you sell shares. And that's how you get your money back. When you give the mutual fund your 50 bucks, you're actually buying however many shares that is, depending on the cost of the mutual fund. And they get into the you know thousands of shares, so you don't have to worry about the taken care of by the mutual fund. And then when you want your money back, you redeem or you sell the mutual fund the shares, the mutual fund shares back to the company. And when people refer to a mutual fund, they're almost exclusively referring to an open-end mutual fund. So if they don't say closed-end or ETF, as we'll see whatever an ETF is later on, they mean an open-end mutual fund. And as of December 9, 2019, there were almost 9,500 of these open-end mutual funds, totaling $22 trillion dollars. So obviously they're the you know they're, they're the large gorilla, right? However, as we'll see, their their prominence has been uh, has been fading. They're still by far the largest uh, portion of the mutual fund industry, but there's a new upstart that's giving them a run for their money, so to speak. The next category are closed-end mutual funds, and notice that they're only about four percent of the mutual funds. They operate with a fixed number of shares outstanding. The shares are issued by the investment company only when the fund is organized. So there's a set number of shares. Whereas an open-end mutual fund, as people give them more money, they create new shares. When people per sell the shares back, they destroy those shares. That's how it works. Where an open -end, a closed-end mutual fund is a very different. They say, okay, we're going to start with whatever, 10 million shares, and that's it. And then once those original shares are sold, you buy them from another in investor through your brokerage company. Uh, it's very similar to how stocks work, as we'll learn later on. So closed-end investment companies are not as popular within ind individual investors as open-end investment companies. In fact, they're becoming less and less and less popular. At the end of 2019, there were only 500 closed-end mutual funds holding only $278 billion. Wait a minute. $22 billion or whatever it was, $23 billion <laughs> in, uh, in um, open-end and only 278, I'm sorry, 20, $23 trillion. I My apologies. Uh, <laughs> uh, and $278 billion. Yeah, in, in recent years, both of these numbers, the number of closed-end mutual funds and the amount of money invested in them have been steadily shrinking. And it's not, it doesn't look like they're going to go away, but they're always going to be a, it seems to me, a small part of the um, mutual fund universe. So both of these um, need to know the net asset value. With both of these, we need to know the net asset, out, net asset value. And what does that mean? That's the underlying value of one share in a particular mutual fund. 
and the net asset value is computed at the close of business, 4 o'clock Eastern time, 1 o'clock our time here in California, every, day, every business day. So what does the company do? They add up the value of the security, stocks, bonds, whatever they're investing in, and then they subtract any liabilities, which is normally, you know, close to a small, it's a small percentage, unless it's a very small mutual fund. And then you divide by the number of shares. So that has to be done. That's part of the Investment Company Act of 1940. Every business day, they add up the value of their, of their investments, subtract any you know, bills that they have to pay, and then divide by the number of shares. Open-end mutual funds are sold at net asset value with a sales load added to any load funds, whereas closed-end mutual funds are bought and sold on the open market. So their price usually either reflects a premium or a discount to the net asset value, often a discount. Closed-end mutual funds are rarely priced at their net asset value. Now, it's not going to be that far away, typically, unless there's some uh, some unusual situation where people might believe there's some fraud involved or something like that, but that's that's just very, very rare. So, so with an open-end mutual fund, you're going to get the net asset, net asset value. The closed-end mutual fund, it, it's up to the marketplace because they're bought and sold um, at, like stocks. So here's the calculation that the book wants you to learn how to do, and I don't care that you learn how to do it because it's done for you. All you can do is look it up. But you take the value of the fund's portfolios and you subtract any liabilities. What are liabilities? You know, the mutual fund is run as a corporation, so it, it's got to pay people salaries and rent and utilities, and and maybe some people are taking some money out, so they have to that they have to pay them. So you subtract the liabilities and you divide by the number of shares outstanding. So in this example, if the mutual fund's value of their portfolio was $10,050,000, and I chose that for a reason that you'll see in a minute, <laughs> and we subtract out the $50,000 that they have to pay for rent or salaries or whatever, we have $10 million. Now, if there are a million shares, $10 million divided by a million shares gives us a net asset value of $10. Now, if it's an open-end mutual fund, that's what it is. It, it's the net asset value is ten bucks, and that's what the price you'll get. If it's a closed-end mutual fund, it might sell for nine dollars and seventy-eight cents, or ten dollars and twelve cents. It's up to the marketplace. And then, if it's a load fund, there for that's for open-end mutual funds, there will be a sales commission. If it's a load fund, and maybe it's five percent, in which case you would wind up paying $10.50. And we'll discuss the loads in detail in our next presentation. Okay? Okay, cool. So now, that's don't worry about that calculation. You don't have to do it. It's done for you. You just look it up on the infernal net or the, or, you know, or whatever, whatever your method of investigating your potential investments are. Now, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of open-end versus closed-end mutual funds? Well, open-end investment companies, are, you're always able to buy and sell. There's no market forces. They're very popular. You have a wide range of choices. Remember, almost 80% of mutual funds are open-end. Large purchases or redemptions can make management of the fund more difficult. What? Well, this is not something that we have to worry about. We're not running the fund. But think about it. If you're an, a mutual fund and you're very popular, I mean, you're very successful, you will become very popular indeed. And people will shower you, shower you with love and attention and a whole lot of money. Now, what do you do? You know, you've, you've done very well. You have these 120-some shares, that uh, different types of companies that you own, and you're very happy with them. Do you just buy more shares of those companies? Or do you find more, more uh, companies that you want to invest in? So... So large mutual funds become difficult to manage. Now, there are some companies that have dealt with this. They've used different techniques to deal with that. But many companies will just close the fund to new investors. What does that mean? It's like, it, what they're saying is, look, look, we're very happy. Thank you very much for all the love and attention and money. But we don't want any new investors. If you're with the fund, you can stick with us. But new investors are not welcome. 
and uh, you know, they sometimes they'll reopen the fund if the if the assets go down, if they lose, you know, people taking their money out, whatever. But other companies say, no, 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 we're going to handle it differently. We're simply going to add more mutual fund managers, and so that basically your mutual fund will be a mutual fund of mutual funds. You'll have uh, separate. Uh, accounts in and you won't see this. You, it's, not, it's not something you have to worry about. But the mutual fund will just add more investment professionals to the fund, and essentially, you know, one one person will be involved in taking watching over their set of stocks and the or bonds or whatever, and the other com the other individuals will look at theirs. And some of the best ones, in my humble opinion, are the ones that work as a team but make their own decisions. So one, one manager could be buying uh, Microsoft, for example. The other managers could be selling it. And instead of a committee where everybody has to agree to the, the, what they're going to buy and sell, these companies, they welcome that dynamism. They welcome that tension because they often find that, that out of, that, out of that, um, that give and take come the best investment decisions. And that's my; those are my favorite kind of companies, and they're out there. Look at look for them. Now, what are the advantages, disadvantages of closed end mutual funds? Well, closed end mutual funds, you got to pay the broker's commission. You don't pay a lot sales load, but you have to pay a broker's commission as if you were, you know, dealing with a stock. And you must buy and sell them via the marketplace, so there are market forces involved. And as we said, they're often sold as a premium or a discount to the net asset value. So you might have bought it at a premium. But now all of a sudden it's selling at a discount. Oh, well. But the cool thing about a closed-end mutual fund is it's much easier for the manager. They don't have to worry about a ton of money coming in the door or a ton of money leaving the door. They know how much they're going to deal with. So it's easier for the manager to take a long-term perspective because they know what's going to be in or what's not going to be in, how much is going to be in their, their fund. All right, so now we finally get to the third type, which are taking the world by storm. And these are called ETFs. It stands for Exchange Traded Funds. And almost 20%, and this number is growing, of uh, mutual funds are ETFs. ETFs are open-end mutual funds, which means there's no limit to how many shares. Shares are created and destroyed. As, as people send in money and take out money. But they trade on the stock exchange. They trade like a stock, like closed-end mutual funds. So they're a hybrid. There's no limit to the number of shares. They issue shares as needed. But the investor must purchase the fund using a brokerage account, which means you're going to incur brokerage fees, right? Ah, these mutual fund companies are not stupid. They're very smart. Uh, Fidelity and Vanguard, two of the major lar lar others have done this, I'm sure, but I haven't, I haven't followed them. But Fidelity and Vanguard, two of the monsters in the, in, the, in the mutual fund industry, have created their own brokerage companies. You know, they're sister companies. They're a different company because a brokerage company is, is regulated very differently in a mutual fund company. But they have the same name, right? Fidelity Investment Services, I think it's called, or whatever it is. Um, and so what you do is if you open an account with their brokerage firm and buy their ETFs, they waive the commission. Very smart marketing, huh? Yeah, not, they're not dumb. They're smart. They want to get more and more investors, and, um, and they want to make it easy for you. So you don't have to pay a brokerage fee. But then, of course, we're going to discuss the, some of the brokerage companies that are not even charging brokerage fees and commissions anymore. Uh, don't fool yourself. You're being charged. We'll learn how that happens when we get the stocks. Introduced in the 1990s, ETFs have become very, very popular, and we'll discuss some of the reasons later on. But you'll hear people say, ah, mutual, open-end mutual funds. They don't even use the term open-end. They don't know that, 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 that that's what they're called. Ah, mutual funds are going away. ETFs are the future. Well, first of all, ETFs are mutual funds, so <laughs> they, they're, but they're being a little silly there. But they're talking about open-end mutual funds and it's true, some open-end mutual funds are bleeding uh, assets, but others are doing okay. So I don't think they're going to go away. There's still 80% of the marketplace. 
And so let's take a look at slide number 15 and look at the growth of the ETF industry. Let's go back to 2006, and you see that there were 359. And if you jump to 2019, there's over 2,000. And from $423 billion in 2006, we now have $4.4 trillion, $4,396 billion. Yeah. And remember, 2008 is still in our memory. And look at the drop in 2008, even as the number of ETFs has grown. So again, you're going to hear people say, oh, ETFs are the future. ETFs are the perfect. Nothing's perfect, dear students. Nothing is perfect. But they do have a lot going for them, especially for people who like to trade, which is something I hope you may do sometime in the future. But don't, don't bet the farm because ETFs are like stocks. They can be bought and sold throughout the day. An open-end mutual fund, no. You only buy it once at the net asset value at the end of the day. And if you try to do buying and selling of your open-end mutual funds, the company would not be happy. And some of them will just kick you out. They'll just say, we don't want you as an investor. Others will say, okay, every time you do that, we're going to charge you 2%. How's that for a deal? And you go, okay, I'm not going to do that. But where are ETFs? Trade away, which is one of the reasons I'm not so excited about these things. But that's, you know, neither here nor there. That, that, that's why there's chocolate and vanilla, and some people like strawberry. If you want to trade, speculate, buy and sell, best of luck to you. Slide number 16. How are mutual funds regulated? Well, dear students, I'm here to tell you that the folks in Washington from time to time do get their act together and play nice in the sandbox. And one of those examples is the Investment Company Act of 1940. It was the foundation of the modern mutual fund industry. Now, as we said, there were mutual funds before this. They started in 1920s, modeled after uh, investment um, uh investment uh, unit trusts, as they were called, unit investment trusts that started in Scotland, of all places. But but the, the regulators didn't know what to do with these things. They were kind of at a loss. Wait, wait a minute, what's going on here? When you make money, the IRS says, hey, you know, you got to pay us taxes. And the mutual fund company said, no, no, you don't understand. Don't, 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 no. We're investing on behalf of our investors. Go tax them. And they kind of, sh some of the states were not too happy about this. And the federal government was kind of befuddled. So the Congress got together and created the Investment Company Act of 1940. It has stood the test of time. It defined a regulated investment company. Remember, the investment company is a legal term. As a pass-through investment vehicle. The, in the mutual fund doesn't pay the taxes. They distribute the earnings, the dividends, the interest, the capital gains to the shareholders, and the shareholders pay the taxes. Okay, okay, that makes sense. As long as Uncle Sam and, and the states are getting their due, they say, okay, we can live with that. To qualify, an investment company must hold almost all their assets as investments in stocks, bonds, and other traditional securities there is very limited ability to use dividends and other risky strategies, although that's some of the mutual funds have, have been doing some, what I consider, hanky-panky with your money and getting away with it. I'm not sure exactly how. I'm not a securities lawyer, nor do I have any <laughs> ambition to become one. But for the vast majority of us, we're interested in mutual funds that invest in stocks, bonds, and you know, short-term investments and the like. And they must use no more than 5% of their assets when acquiring a particular security. Now, so why? Why is that? Well, think about it. The idea behind a mutual fund is diversification. So if a mutual fund could turn around and just buy one stock, that's not diversified. So they must buy at least 20 stocks, right? 5% into 100% is 20 now, as we said, most mutual funds are going to have a whole lot more than 20 stocks. But the idea is to encourage, and in, in, in fact, to enforce 
diversification, which is one of the main reasons why we buy mutual funds. And then the mutual fund company must create an organization with checks and balances. Where does that sound familiar, right? That's what our government's supposed to have. <laughs> They've been falling down the job lately, but let's hope they get their act together. But in the case of the mutual fund company, this is what we wind up with. And if I didn't make this. If I had made this, I would have put the shareholders at the bottom of the pyramid because I think they're the basis. But I get the idea. The shareholders are the investors. And who is representing the interest of the investors? A board of directors. Now, for many years, these boards of directors were often uh, poo-pooed as basically rubber stamps. They really weren't you know, doing their due diligence and watching over the mutual funds. It's true of, it was true of some mutual funds, not true of others. But more, uh, more and more attention has been given to the boards of directors, and now they take a more active role in overseeing the mutual fund because they're your representatives as, the, as shareholders. And the mutual fund itself is composed of several entities, not just, it's not just one entity. There are several entities that often act independently for a good reason. There's the investment advisor, the management company, which manages the fund's portfolio according to the objectives described in the fund's prospectus. And these are the people with the top hats. Remember we talked about them? They're not the entire mutual fund. They're, they're the, the individuals making the decisions. But do they hold on to the funds? Are they the ones in charge? No. There's a custodian, a separate entity that actually holds on to the fund's assets, maintaining them separately to protect the shareholder's interests. So in other words, these people in the investment company can't run away with the funds. <laughs> yeah, right. It makes sense. Then there's a distributor that actually sells the shares, either directly through the public or through other firms, brokerage firms and the like and a transfer agent that actually processes the orders to buy and redeem the fund shares. And then there is an independent public accountant. Uh, these are them, the, they used to be called the big eight. Now they're down to about five or so. You might have heard of KPMG and PricewaterhouseCoopers. I think it's called Pricewaterhouse, Deloitte, and Tooch. Tooch. These are the big accounting firms. And their job is to go in there and certify that everything's being done correctly, right? You said you have 100,000 shares of, of uh, Netflix. Okay, where are they? Oh, here they are. The custodian has them at this individual brokerage firm or whatever. So there's a, there's a give and take, a, a checks and balances, so that, you know, that, that hanky-panky, trucos, truco, trumpas don't occur, little tricks and, and what, yeah, just that, that's the idea. And the next couple of slides basically go through what we just described in the, in the graphic. The mutual fund is a corporation run by the board of directors. The board of di boards of directors are voted in by shareholders, and they um, oversee the, the, the fund's operations on behalf of the shareholders. The investment advisor, the management company, has portfolio managers, uh, sometimes called investment managers, portfolio counselors, I've heard them called. They sometimes work as a team, sometimes work as a committee. I prefer the team approach. And then they have research analysts who focus on a specific industry. And the best companies, in my humble opinions, have the research analysts actually buying and selling some shares. See, what happens in the industry often is the research analysts, all they want to do is become a portfolio manager because that's where the money is, right? But in some companies, they give the research analysts uh, um, some money to invest. And they say, okay, you know, you told me you thought GM is going to do better than Ford. Uh, go ahead, buy some shares. And it gives them experience in owning companies and, 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 um, and bonds, and if they buy bonds. And so that grooms them for a later uh, uh, position as a portfolio manager. But some of them decide, no, I'm very happy being a research analyst. That's my career goal. And that's where I want to stay. And that, and that works for their advantage, doesn't it? I think so. And then the distributor distributes the shares to the public and to dealers, much the same role as an investment bank. And we'll discuss investment banks and in, in initial public offerings in the next chapter when we discuss stocks. So, uh, so that's, that, that's their job. It's the job to get the shares out there. And once the shares are out there, the custodian holds those securities. Uh, it's often a bank or a trust company. 
And then the transfer agent takes care of the purchase and redemption requests and the independent public accounting firm certifies the fund's financial reports. Well, huh, why the large diversification of... Oh, by the way, I'm not going to quiz you on the individual uh, components. You don't have to memorize all this. So just, just know that there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a system in place to protect you as the uh, shareholder. Why the large diversification of tasks and companies? Well, mutual funds are highly regulated in order to protect protectors to protect shareholders' investments from fraud and collapse. How often have you heard of a scandal at a mutual fund company? Huh? Well, until 2003, you just never heard of. Wait a minute, Piano. Wait a minute. Did you just say mutual fund scandals? You want me to invest in an industry that is plagued with scandal? Well, since 1940, the mutual fund industry has been regulated and escaped any hint of impropriety. You like that word, impropriety? It means hanky-panky. There was a guy, I think in 1970 or so, he was actually a friend of Richard Nixon, which was a big embarrassment for the president, who ran away with $4 million somewhere. He ran to Cuba, of all places. But no, it just... It has been squeaky clean. Well, what happened? In 2003, some practices that were not quite illegal, but obviously unethical, were uncovered. Only a handful of people and funds were affected. Strong funds. The, jo the guy who started this, I mean, think about this, folks. You're worth, at the time, $600 million. You started this company from scratch. You built it into one of the you know preeminent mutual fund companies. And you're playing these games, which netted him about 80 grand. Now, to you and me, $80,000, that's a lot of money. But to somebody who's worth $600 million, why did he do it? And he was very contrite. He said, I've ruined my life. I've let down the ones, the people all around me for, for just why? Just because I started to believe all the thing, the great things people were told about me. And I believed that I was in... Vincible, and I could get away with anything. Janice, Bank of America, Putnam, poor George Putnam rolling over his, his grave. And Alliance, Alliance Mutual Funds, they're a very good company. In fact, we're going to take a look at one of their, their mutual funds in the next chapter. Two people, two people at the fund were doing this. The vast majority of companies never engaged in any of the shenanigans. And what were they doing, folks? Well, it's a little difficult to describe, but they were essentially stealing tiny little pieces of pennies from your fellow and shareholders. And how do you pull this off? Well, think about it. You have a fund that invests in Japan. And we'll see that there are mutual funds that invest just in individual companies. According to the Investment Company of Act of 1940, we use 4 o'clock New York time, Eastern Standard Time, as the time when we you know, pony up and uh, find out what our securities are worth. But 4 o'clock uh, Eastern time is, what, 4 a.m. in the morning or 6 a.m. in the morning in Japan? And so if the markets in the United States have crashed for some reason, you know, fallen a few percentage points, you would sell your Japanese fund, which is still using yesterday's, uh, you know, their, yeah, their yesterday's, it's already the next day in Japan, it's still using their... Uh, their um, values from the day before. You then wait for the Japanese market to open, and if and and more and more of this is true, as, as the markets around the world are sort of more more not always, but they move in lockstep more often. So you've seen the stock market in New York fall precipitously. You sell your Japanese fund, and then the next day you wait for the Japanese market to fall, and then you turn around the next day and buy it back. You see what you just did? You might have earned yourself one or two percent, but you know you do that you know every day for you know forty days out of the year, and that's a pretty darn good return. And but what you're doing is you're literally stealing you know assets from your fellow shareholders. I mean, it's it's uh, much of it, in my humble opinion, is just plain silliness. I don't have time for this stuff. But if you have enough money, such as somebody who's worth six hundred million dollars it can turn into a tiny little sum. Now, was it illegal? No, it wasn't illegal, but it was definitely unethical. 
And other companies just would not let you do this. Some companies said, no, you can't do this. Uh, some companies say, if you sell a mutual fund, you can't buy it back for at least 30 days. They just don't want to let you do it. Other companies will say, sure, you can buy it back, but we're going to charge you 2%. So sure, go right ahead. You know? <laughs> and where does that money go? It goes into the fund. So you, instead of stealing from your fellow investors, you're, you know, you're basically helping them. And so it really wasn't that big a deal, but it was still unethical, and it was still not something that should be should be, should have been done. And when it was uncovered, it was a big scandal, and now nobody does it. And you didn't lose much, folks. If you, how I say here in the in the in the in the, um, in the slide, I say instead of losing ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars ninety nine cents on a hundred thousand dollar account, Enron, WorldCom. Investors might have lost a penny on a $100,000 account or maybe lost 0.01 pennies or whatever. But still, it was wrong and it should not have been done and it won't happen again until the next time. I mean, no, <laughs> no, no it's, it, it would be very difficult for them to pull off something like this again because of the scrutiny that's involved now. Okay, so we want you to go back and review this because... Uh, it's important to understand open end versus closed end, even though it's different. And probably most people will never invest in closed end mutual funds, but ETFs, and they understand the growth of the industry and how the industry is set up. Because in our next presentation, dear students, we are going to look at how we are charged fees. <laughs> yeah. See you when we discuss mutual fees and how we're being charged for our investment services.